I'm here in the heart of Bloomsbury in central London as part of Oxford Brookes University Black History Month. I'm here to interview Margaret Busby, OBE. She's a writer, broadcaster, and mostly known as a publisher. She's published a range of distinguished writers from around the globe and has long been a campaigner for diversity in publishing. Let's find out about the power of publishing and maybe pick up some tips if you're dreaming about a career in the realms of the written word. Margaret, thank you so much for agreeing to talk to us for Oxford Brookes University Black History Month 2019. Thank you for having me. Now, can you tell us how did it all start in the publishing world for you? It's a long story, Pauline. <laughs> <laughs> we go back to me being at university when I was 17. Uh, I went to London University, Bedford College. And I was at a party given by a friend of mine who was having her first novel published and was also getting engaged. So it was a party at which her fiancé had invited his friends, I was there. And in the way that happens at parties, you're introduced to somebody doing something similar to you. And I'd been involved in my college literary magazine, so I was in, in, introduced to this guy who'd been doing things with poetry at, in Oxford. And his name was Clive Allison. And we said, we were discussing what we were going to do when we both graduated, and publishing came up. So we said, well, why don't we start a publishing company? And so we met up again after we graduated, uh, by which time I, I think I wasn't quite married. I was married to, to a jazz musician. And so my publishing was a separate issue. I, I was never involved with my business partner. I have to say that because people, I don't know why it is that people assume because you know, a man and a woman, the man must be, you know, the is only there because he's <laughs> making the tea or something. <laughs> but anyway, you know, we, were, we were equal partners and, and I was married to somebody else and we started publishing with cheap poetry paperback books because we were young and we wanted to publish books that young people like us could afford. So that was our first venture. And then uh, a friend of my, my husband's, as he was, I can't remember when I got married, but I did get married eventually to this jazz musician. And <laughs> a friend of his had bumped into an African-American on a, a Greek island called Mykonos. And this African-American was a writer called Sam Greeley who was just trying to get his first novel published. He had sent it out to publishers on both sides of the Atlantic and nobody wanted it. So this friend, Alexis Lickyard, said, oh, I know somebody who started the publishing company and sent Sam to me and I borrowed 50 pounds so I could give it to Sam so he could stay in London and I could work with him on the manuscript. And the book was called The Spooker Sat by the Door and this became our first full-time novel. And it's, uh, we actually persuaded the observer to serialize it, not to serialize it, to do extracts in their color magazine, because we didn't know you weren't meant to do that, and we sent it back to them when they said no, and they ended up doing it. And then we sold translation rights to Holland, Japan, Italy, around the world. We sold it back to America, and it became a success. So that was, that was our first um, big success, and we went on. And the company still exists, actually, though I'm no longer with that. Uh, Alison and Busby. It's there as an imprint and, and it publishes different books, but, but as far as I know, really good books. And after I left, one of the things I did was to put together this anthology, Daughters of Africa, which was in 1992. So and that was quite a groundbreaking thing. I think it was at the time, an international anthology of words and writings by women of African descent from the ancient Egyptian to the present. And it was commissioned by a, a wonderful visionary young editor I, I, I met called Candida Lacey, who was then at Pandora. And we put together, or I put together this, this anthology, which has uh, more than 200 women of African descent through the centuries, through the generations. Because I wanted to show that there were more talented, creative black women, women of African descent, than you would have thought of. 
at that time when you, you'd have heard of Alice Walker or Maya Angelou, Tony Morrison, who were all in here. But there were so many other people who deserved to have you know, some sort of attention paid to them. So that was the rationale behind the original Daughters of Africa. And here we are in 2019. Candle Lacey is now publisher of Myriad Editions New Internationalists. Based in Oxford. Based in Oxford partly, based in Brighton partly. And so we decided that we needed to do a new volume. And so earlier this year, um, in March 2019, we published New Daughters of Africa, which again has more than 200 women of African descent in it. A completely different set of, of contributors from the first volume. It's not an update in that sense. And we did this in a different way because... I really wanted to make sure that there was an ongoing legacy involved in the publication of this book. So I approached many more than the writers listed in here, saying this is what we wanted to do, and the only way it's going to be possible is if everybody joins in and waves their fees, so that because of that we can have some sort of ongoing legacy. And what really pleases me about this anthology is, apart from the wonderful contributors in here and their generosity in all waiving their fees, there is now this award called the Margaret Busby New Daughters of Africa Award, which is a collaboration between Myriad Editions, the publisher, and London, London University's SOAS, School of Oriental and African Studies, which means that a woman student from Africa will get a free course of study doing a, a particular course at SOAS and free accommodation worth well, £20,000. And, and because there's a crowdfunding uh, you know, site, that we hope that it's going to go on and it'll, it'll be a continuing legacy. So that because of this book, we're going to be able to have some sort of connection, ongoing connection with African women who want to study literature or language, and in that way, New York of Africa will have a continuing legacy. Other universities take note. Exactly. An excellent exactly. idea and a worthwhile idea. Yes. And there's some wonderful gems in New Daughters of Africa because, of course, it features Kit de Waal, who is an alumna of Oxford Brookes University MA Creative Writing. Good. And um, maybe you can tell us a bit about the connections between well, there, the two books. One of the things that I really find interesting and, and kind of thrilling in a way is, is that there are many writers in this volume who were influenced by having come across the 1992 volume. Not only because, I mean, for example, Candy Scarty Williams said that Daughter of Africa was on her godmother's bookshelf. So that's how, and she's now a big name starting out, but so she was empowered by that. There, there are writers, for example, there's a writer in here um, who said that when she was trying to start up writing, she thought you had to be Nigerian because most of the African writers were Nigerian, so she pretended to be Nigerian. No, she wasn't until she found Daughters of Africa and saw, no, she could be from anywhere. <laughs> so there are writers who were inspired. There are writers who are connected in relationships, apart from having been influenced by the writing. For example, in that volume, there is a, a Ghanaian um, pioneering writer called Mabel Dove, Mabel Dove Dankwa, in this volume is her niece called Nardang, Nardav. In Daughters of Africa was Alice Walker. In New Daughters, of, New Daughters of Africa is Rebecca Walker. And Zadie Smith, who's in New Daughters of Africa, gave her mother Daughters of Africa when, she, when it first came up. And her mother, Yvonne Bailey Smith, is also in New Daughters of Africa. Fantastic. So there are these wonderful intergenerational links as well as links in terms of the influences that the writers have had on each other over the years and over the generations. Now, you have written yourself and you have published alongside. What spark are you looking for in a piece of writing? It's hard, it's hard to say that in advance. It, I mean, one recognises talent when you read it, emotion, connects with you. And one of the things that writers such as Toni Morrison, who is a wonderful inspiration, both in terms of her, her having been connected with the publishing industry, as well as in her, her writing of fiction and so on, 
one of the things she said that, that, that she began writing because she wanted to write the books she couldn't find to read. And I think that's applicable to writers such as Alice Walker and, and many others who are moved to write because the books that they want to read don't yet exist. And I think one of the reasons why it's important that we, I say you, we, meaning you and I, people who look like us and people who come from a diverse background are involved in the publishing industry is that that gives a different perspective. So that it's not that I'm only interested in books by black writers or only interested in things that are connected with um, black subject matter, but my perspective is based on what I know, my upbringing. So it'll be different from that of somebody who comes from a different perspective. So I think for that reason, it's necessary to have a, you know, a, a really broad, um, perspe- you know, a broad range of people involved in the industry. In fact, one of the sayings that I, I always quote that Toni Morrison um, said in one of her essays is that the subject of the dream is the dreamer. And if you have a word of advice for our students who are writers and trying to hone their skills as writers or as publishers, what would you have to say to them? First of all, you have to be a good reader before you know what good writing is. And you have to realise that publishing is necessary. We can't all just say, I want to be a writer. Some of us have to say, I want to be a publisher. Otherwise, we're forever not being represented with rep- represented within the, in- the industry. So I think you have to, and it's not that you have to choose either or. As I said, Toni Morrison was an editor and a writer, creative writer. So was Alice Walker. So, were, so was F. West Sutherland from Ghana. So there were many writers who've also been involved in the publishing industry in one way or another. And I think it's important that that continues. Not, not everybody will, will be a publisher, and publishing has different, different departments, so it's not that everybody has to be an editorial person. There's publicity, there's sales, there are all other departments within the publishing industry. But then you have to think, why do I want to be a writer as well? And a lot of people, I think, think that writing is a way, some sort of shortcut to being rich and famous. No, that's not the point of it. I always say to people, don't be a writer unless you can't not be a writer. So if, if, you, if you find yourself unable to stop writing, great. But you don't have to stop and think, is this going to make me money? No, that's not the point of it. Well, Margaret, it's been a wonderful insight. Thank you so much for talking to us today. It's been a great pleasure, Pauline, and I, I just hope that some of the words I've said will have some effect on someone. Good effect, I hope. <laughs> Absolutely. So that concludes our interview for Black History Month 2019 at Oxford Brookes University. And I think there were some nuggets and some gems dating back from the 60s to the present day from Margaret Busby, publisher par excellence. Thank you. <laughs>